it would be great so we okay, are live so now that. we are live now and uh, good morning and good evening depending on the respective time zones my name is sara rahman sheik and i am an english honor student of rani billa girls college under calcutta university i welcome you to the stories of tribal identity and culture that will explore the role of tribal art and tribal representation in art in shaping cultural identity and ideology curated under tmys review june 2024 in collaboration with the center for asia pacific initiatives university of victoria we are also calling for the submission of essays poems and short stories under the project to know more about the submission guidelines and the project architecture please visit www.tellmeyourstory.biz today I consider myself very privileged to be in the company of our esteemed panelist Dr. Vandana Bhandari, Emily Macculloch Childs and Ms. Safi uh, Linden uh, who will shortly share their views and insights with us. Meetu Basu if she joins then she will also share her views and invaluable insights on the topic. The topic for today's discussion is adopt adaptation of tribal designs in mainstream jewelry and its impact on the global market under the sub theme tribal representation in art before we begin i'd like to introduce our speakers our first speaker for the session is dr vandana bhandari dr vandana uh, bhandari is an educator author administrator with an active social engagement in the fashion and textile sector She has held the position of Dean Academics at National Institute of Fashion Technology. She is currently a design advisor for the Export Promotion Council of Handicrafts. She also serves on the boards of Delhi Craft Council, Shadna Udaipur, and as a director on the board of Textile Society of America. Published widely in journals and magazines, Dr. Bhandari has authored and compiled books on fashion and textiles. Dr. Bhandari has had a deep involvement in developing curriculum, professional design projects for industry and craft-based projects like SGSY and Languishing Crafts of India. We are delighted to have you on the panel, ma'am. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Sarah, for inviting me. Our second speaker for the session is Emily Macculloch Childs. Emily Macculloch Childs is a curator, writer, art historian, researcher and gallerist. She is co-author and publisher of Macculloch's Encyclopedia of Australia, Australian Art and Macculloch's Contemporary Aboriginal Art, The Complete Guide, and also the author of New Beginnings: Classic Paintings from the Corrigan Collection of 21st Century Aboriginal Art. Since 2003 she has been co-director of art company Macculloch and Macculloch with her mother Suzanne Macculloch. They began exhibiting art in 2009 and established a home gallery at their family house Whistlewood on the Mornington Peninsula with a focus on aboriginal art. In 2019 they opened Uh, they opened every when art space in flinders and now work with over 40 communities 300 artists and 25 aboriginal owned nfp art centers we are delighted to have you on the panel ma'am thank you for joining us today thank you for having me our third speaker for the session is um nisafi lindem now uh nisafi lindem Uh, came from the culturally rich region of northeast india she is a researcher and educator who holds a phd in design from the national institute of fashion technology new delhi her doctoral thesis is titled cultural appropriation and semiotic study of textile handwoven in nagaland the angami and sang uh, sangtam tribe she research and write about the handloom and handicrafts of india committed to promoting and preserving the rich cultural heritage uh thank you so much ma'am for being here <laughs> and thank you so much sara uh, so now we will now open the forum for discussion i would request dr v- uh, vandana bhandari to share her insights ma'am over to you now Thank you, Sara. Uh, lovely to be here, and thank you, Emily, for sharing this uh, platform. 
I'm delighted to learn that you worked with the uh, Aboriginal artists. You know, currently uh, my family foundation is having an uh, exhibition on Indian tribal art in New Delhi at the India Art Fair. And uh, we have collaborated with the uh, Niram uh, uh, in Australia to bring in some Aboriginal art. And one of the artists from there is also uh, showcasing uh, their work. So delighted to be here uh, and um, uh, speaking on uh, tribal art. Um, so today, uh, the, the topic that we're talking on is uh, ornaments and jewelry of uh, Nagaland, India, and how these have been adapted to mainstream jewelry, and what has been the impact of these pieces on the global market and also, we, you know, Nisa is going to try and uh, understand, and I should start calling her Dr. Lindum because she's recently received her doctoral uh, 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 degree. Uh, so uh, Dr. Lindum will talk about how this then affects the people themselves. So when there are adaptations done by others and how then it comes back to them, how does it affect them? How do they feel about the issues of cultural uh, appropriation? And are they happy about it? Does it affect their sensitivities? And we do know that, you know, cultures which are so rich uh, and so deeply, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in, into their into their whole symbolism of things, they are they are not particularly happy when those symbols are used for just a pieces of let's say a fashion garment or a fashion jewelry, and that was the basis of her thesis. Um, uh, and, um, could you share the presentation, Dr. Um, Lindum? Then we could go yes, forward. Yes, I will just do that. Yeah. <clears throat> And while she's sharing, I will just uh, continue talking because I know we are live and uh, we do want, uh, don't want people to be waiting for uh, information. So as we know, you know, every nation, region and community has a very diverse and a characteristic identity. And uh, that is that becomes um, available to us through through what they wear and through the way they, they live, through the food that they eat, their rituals, their festivals, their song, language. And uh, these things, when we start to study them, they just reveal such a strong connection to what they actually believe in, what their ideologies are. And uh, um, at many, many times, it also helps us to understand how um, you know, when they were they were being ruled by, let's say, they, they had a colonial influence on them, uh, how that really harmed their culture and how it took away from the culture and what a battle it has been for these people to actually come back to this, uh, you know, try to revive some of these things and how much has been uh, lost. And clothing and ornamentation to me has always been one of the most visible signs because we may not go into people's homes, but if you just go into a village in India and you see people around, you can really understand who they are. <clears throat> uh, and many of these indigenous communities are trying at this point to reclaim their legacy. And it's a great time to be doing that in the world because we're talking so much about sustainability. We are talking about going back to the roots. And... Uh, they are trying to, to preserve and to somehow connect back to the cultural traditions. And often these communities, when, when their work is chosen, um, they are left uncredited and marginalized. If we just go to slide three, Nisa. So we know that uh, uh, tribal groups have been residing in India since uh, the earliest times. Even in the present day, there are various tribal communities in different parts of the country. Uh, they largely stay separated and dwell in uh, green and hilly regions, especially in uh, Nagaland. And uh, in India, they have been um, mostly nomadic. They have also lived in the forest and survived really, you know, uh, through um, uh, getting their food from the forest. And... Uh, uh, their traditional crafts and objects such as weapons, axes, bows, etc., are um, 
are their, their handloom. These are some of the crafts that they actually uh, practice. Uh, I'm going to request Nisa to take over from here. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so the tribal communities in India are known to be one of the most vulnerable communities. And according to the census, um, the tribals constitute about 8.61% of the overall population of the country. And uh, a big concentration of the indigenous communities is found within the seven states of Northeast India. Uh, weaving, jewelry making and other crafts are an indispensable part of uh, Naga culture. And like most other crafts among the indigenous people, jewelry making is done um, alongside other family chores by women in the Naga society. Uh, within the craft history of India, the textiles and ornaments of Nagaland have a special place and there is a need to um, accurately document and present them. The rich and unique uh, indigenous ornaments with symbolic uh, colors and motives speaks volumes regarding the wearer but have become uh, less significant among the younger generation today also various researchers are attempting to bring out the critical sociological meaning of the ornaments uh, on the one hand and to revive the traditional symbolism of such indigenous crafts so that younger generations are not um, detached completely from their own uh, Naga culture. And uh, the available information on Nagaland ornaments has provided insights into the intricate designs, cultural significance associated uh, with the wearers and the historical as well as contemporary usage of these textiles. Um, but over the years, notable shifts in the social status of individuals have prompted a socio-cultural uh, reappropriation of the Naga textiles as well as the ornaments. And when we're talking about ornaments and jewelry of the Nagas, in the past, the Nagas would wear various uh, kinds of beads around the neck. And a specific bead, usually made of uh, opaque red stones, uh, which was known as Diomani in Assam, uh, was one of the most prized possession at one time. So a short string of these beads was worth around uh, 120, uh, 100 rupees in the 1920s, which was about $1.20. Uh, in addition to this, uh, carnelian, which is a red gemstone, was also popular. Uh, white beads made from the interior of corn shells, turquoise beads and uh, black colored beads made from the seed of plantain and bone was also used as fasteners. Um, triangular pieces of shells. Misa, were... is it possible for you to go full screen? Uh, my message I'm going full screen. No, I'm just seeing a small screen and the write up. So yeah. I think you're in presentation mode. I think uh, ma'am will try to join soon. Okay. Yes, I'm, I'm sure yeah. she will. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> There's just some uh, issue that took place because of the PPT. Uh, so not an issue with that. So, you know, when, when uh, this, this research was being done, uh, we found that a lot of the motives, um, and we've seen talks of this not only just in um, in uh, uh, tribal textiles, but also other types of textiles. People just 
borrow motifs they borrow their uh, the designs the styles and they try to um, talk of it as their own and uh, there has been a huge movement against this and people are really um, you know saying that what is ours maybe if people want to use it some kind of credit has to be given to the the actual uh, people who own it from uh, generations and thousands of years so uh, you know that's that's the whole talk of uh, cultural uh, reappropriation and appropriation and um, it's it's extremely important that the people who own this traditional knowledge are acknowledged in some way um preferably in a financial manner or give back to the community when these uh things are used uh you know which which really belong to their culture and it's part of their identity <clears throat> nisafi are you able to very uh, sorry yeah i just got disconnected yeah i'll just so if there's any yeah yeah if there's any issue in sharing the ppt you can share me uh through either whatsapp or through mail i can do it for you as well not an oh, issue ma'am okay. yeah do you want me to do it nisa you can just keep no, I will uh, just, uh, yeah yeah i'll just try once more i think it's yeah. all right i'm unfortunately on an apple computer and it never shares anything properly so i'm very reluctant to share anything it just goes you know whatever i have it will show us something else on the on the screen yes i know security is feels... a little high yeah that's that's <laughs> quite a crisis you know you've done something yeah. and it shows us something else. perfect yeah yes is it working now yes yes, yes that's yes. very good just All come right. on slide All 8 right. 9 yeah slide 9 yeah that's it so uh, a lot of the materials that they use are also uh, used because of some symbolic significance uh, for example in the olden days uh, uh, they had also used uh, shells for trading and at the time when slavery was still uh, prevalent a male slave was priced at one cow and three corn shells and whereas a female a female slave was worth three cows uh, four or five corn shells and uh, in the same way a lot of other things could also be traded so there is a lot of thought behind these ornaments and at present most of the nagas have lost the original and authentic jewelry unfortunately made from these materials which is evident from uh, most of the personal collections that we've studied and uh, as time has passed the nagas have been using ornaments that have a similar look which are made of other materials such as uh, glass crystal beads and plastic beads but one um, can easily spot the differences while holding an old authentic neck piece and the present day uh, contemporary pieces the authenticity of an ornament immediately stands out due to its heavier weight and the local people as well as some of the experts have said that the main reason for the change in raw materials is that it uh, it is convenient to attain new raw materials and beads from the local markets and there has also been been a decreased availability of the traded beads that were used in the past <clears throat> there are also various factors in naga's post uh, colonial as well as cultural religious disarrangement uh, it all created a dramatic change within the tribes in terms of their identity their relationship with their uh, history and culture and a very interesting point that locals and historians frequently mention is that many traditional vintage uh items were lost due to chaos during conflicts and this led to the burning looting and stealing of traditional items and in the process the ornaments that have survived have found their way into museums um historical centers and personal collections worldwide and uh, specifically in the united kingdom um and one of the main reasons is that the british officers who worked in nagaland um in the olden days interacted with the locals a lot 
and most of them were offered traditional items as gifts. And then these were then donated to various museums. Um, so just a few examples, such as uh, this one. Uh, this is an antique tribal Naga necklace that you see here on the left. And if you look at the materials that they have used, uh, they had to use shell fasteners, coral beads. They had to use bone as separators and uh, specifically animal bone. And uh, they've also used carnelian beads. But if you look at the contemporary uh, one that they use these days, that they sell online or uh, in the local markets, they have used a lot of crystal beads and plastic beads as well as uh, plastic um, fasteners and separators. And you would be able to see this in most of the uh, jewelry that is available now. And again, as I've mentioned, it might also be because it's very difficult for them to find uh, the authentic uh, materials. This is another example. This is a bear tooth necklace, uh, which Naga men wear, and it features small terracotta or coral beads, usually varying in uh, strands. And the highlight or the main feature of this necklace is the center uh, pendant piece, which is made from two pieces of bear teeth. Uh, these were held in place and further decorated with brass wires, signifying the warrior's catch while hunting. Um, but today, unfortunately, fake uh, plastic animal teeth are used for making these necklaces in place of the actual animal teeth. Uh, but somehow they've still tried to um, retain that essence of what the jewelry piece is actually about. There are also these sort of necklaces that are contemporary small beaded necklaces. And these are usually inspired by the tribes and their textiles. Um, a modern take on Naga jewelry is quite popular among the Naga tribes today, and a large number of such necklaces are sold all over the world. Um, the, the locals tend to take colors and motives inspiration directly from their textile designs. Uh, and most of them are mostly just color inspired. And apart from necklaces, the local stores have earrings, beads, mufflers, and bracelets that follow the same concept. Sizes and designs vary from piece to piece, and the main materials, again, are usually only made of plastic or crystal or gem beads. But also, if you look at the contemporary piece over here, uh, the way they've represented it, um, I think a person from the Naga community might not be able to recognize it immediately. So a lot of the marketing uh, that is done when selling these contemporary products is also a huge factor, which I'll be talking about later. I'm quite unsure if the Nagas themselves will recognize these also, but they have been marketed as uh, Naga jewelry. Again, another example of an antique uh, necklace that was worn by women in the past. Uh, you can see in the right side that the contemporary version only has plastic beads, uh, plastic separators, and some uh, cotton threads. <clears throat> While in the older version, they would use even wood separators, wooden beads, um, and shell fasteners. So even for uh, jewelry such as these, these days people would uh, make them in, uh, in a way that they're inspired by their uh, traditional textiles. Um, so if you look at these two necklaces, um, 
the purple and the pink were textiles that did not really exist uh, in the past but now because they have started weaving these sort of color combinations so this is again translated uh, into these uh, ornaments so this was a necklace that was worn uh, by the samtam tribe naga women and they would adorn themselves with this carnelian and metal pendant necklace which is also very similar to the Ao Naga women. So a lot of their ornaments and textiles also talk about their uh, migration patterns, which is a very interesting thing to look at. Um, so the local experts said that the status of the women would determine the number of strands in the olden days. And the pendants were usually made of brass in the shape of trumpets or bells. Uh, and at times they would also seen as rectangular bars with zigzag edges. Some say that in the past, the wealthy women um, would wear these pendants made out of, uh, made out of gold and silver as well. These are some other uh, comparisons. The antique necklace at the left side, a slightly contemporary one uh, in the middle, and the most recent, which is made only of plastic beads. They would also have these necklaces, uh, which were necklaces for everyday use. And again, uh, as you can see before, it was just the red color uh, carnelian beads. But now, because due to the uh, introduction of other colors in their textiles, they also started using these sort of newer colors uh, in their jewelry. But uh, the raw material has differed greatly. So many a times, especially when uh, marketing Naga jewelry and ornaments, uh, when you look at uh, different uh, stores and also online shops, um, even when you just type in the term Naga jewelry, you'll see a lot of misrepresented marketing that uh, people have been making uh, themselves and then trying to sell the jewelry uh, saying that they are from Nagaland but when we are actually looking at these pictures for example the ones that you see here uh, me as someone who is from the northeast I can't really say that these are Naga uh, necklaces uh, at the time, there's uh, also a lot of confusion between the different tribes, not even just in the Northeast, but also all over the world. Sometimes uh, jewelry from the Northeast part of Asia, uh, of India, would be, um, uh, there would be a lot of confusion. And some would uh, even say that some uh, African uh, jewelries are part of the Northeastern culture. So which is uh, not the best sort of marketing that we want right now, especially with uh, cultural appropriation. Uh, Ma'am, uh, 10 minutes uh, all over. But if you could right. please just quickly uh, do the presentation, yes. it would be great. Enjoying yes, the presentation. So sorry it. for the time crunch. It's all right. It's all right. I can understand. Uh, yes, and also with uh, ornaments such as these or pendants which in the uh, earlier days the nagas were actually known as uh, headhunters so whenever they would uh, win at uh, war they would wear this sort of pendant to signify that but then when you look at it now there are so many variations that aren't really recognized also So, you know, the idea of contemporization of uh, craft has really led to the idea uh, to the 
to Naga people themselves and many other tribals accepting that there is going to be modernization. And in my view, to some extent, some modernization has to be there. Otherwise, things will just continue to uh, disappear. However, it's important for us to still be able to identify where things have come from originally and how much modernization is acceptable to the actual original users. So I think those are some of the important things. So what are the ethical um, considerations for the, the Naga people? What are they, how do they want to collaborate? How do they want to co-design? Are they ready to do that? And that's true for all other communities also. What are appropriate ornaments? So what would they want uh, to change? What would they not want to change? So, you know, things which are like marital symbols, people don't want to change them. Uh, something which is more ornamental or which is a, a absolute mark of your uh, tribe, people don't want to change that. So. It's, it's just extremely important, I think, education, uh, documenting everything, and then educating people about that becomes extremely important. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much, Dr. Bhandari, ma'am, and Dr. Lindem. It was a very insightful observation, beautiful presentation. Thank you so much for such comprehensive uh, way of explaining such beautiful uh, topic. Uh, now I would uh, request Emily McCulloch Childs to share her insightful observations. Ma'am, over to you now. Thank you. Thank you for having me, everybody. That was really fascinating. Um, I'd just like to say that I'm speaking to you from Bunurong land in the southeast of Australia, and I'd like to acknowledge the Indigenous traditional owners here and all the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people that live in this region, which is called the Mornington Peninsula these days. We have many people from all around Australia who live on the Mornington Peninsula. Um, so I'm the curator of a thing called the Indigenous Jewellery Project, which is a national uh, contemporary jewellery project working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander jewellers. Uh, it was started about 10 years ago and uh, to date, we've probably worked with about 150 jewellers all around Australia wow. and done about nine projects. Um, for about the last six or seven years, I've been collaborating a lot with a contemporary jewellery lecturer at the University of New South Wales called Melinda Young. And she uh, is an amazing teacher and facilitator, curator, writer, and her and I go out to a lot of very remote Aboriginal communities and do workshops with jewellers there. And um, I really created this project because there was a very big gap in the Australian art world and the contemporary jewellery world of Australian Indigenous jewellery. So um, my father's from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and they have a very strong Indigenous contemporary jewellery movement in Aotearoa. There are very, very significant Māori jewellers working there, and there's a lot of um, very close collaboration between Māori, Māori and Pākehā jewellers in Aotearoa. In Australia, this hasn't really happened so much and the subject of this uh today is a bit challenging for me because in one way it's a good thing we haven't had a very large jewelry movement in australia even though jewelry is a very fundamental practice of aboriginal and torres strait islander people we have had some very big uh cases of cultural appropriation in aboriginal art uh, there was a famous case called the carpet case many years ago where uh, an artist's work was taken and reproduced without permission on carpet and led to a very big court case, which was groundbreaking. And um, there's also a lot of cultural appropriation that happens in painting. But because there hasn't been a lot of jewellery in the mainstream um, worlds, I, I suppose, um, there hasn't really been much cultural appropriation happen, which is kind of a good thing in a, in a way. Um, and now we have a very strong Indigenous fashion movement happening from Australia. So I think this is very encouraging because it means that 
we have Indigenous creators who are running, you know, aspects of their industry and things are being done with very strong ethics and education. Um, so, but I thought I'd just talk quickly about um, the international projects that we've done. Most of the projects that we've done have been in Australia. Um, we work with public galleries in craft. So when I first started this project, there weren't many Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander jewellers in either the Aboriginal art space or the contemporary craft space or the public gallery space. There were a couple who were very groundbreaking and who were very influential on me. Um, but I began collecting um, Aboriginal jewellery in particular about 20 years ago or more. And I would get very frustrated because a lot of it would break. A classic example is the necklace that I picked up today to show you, which is one of the ones which led to me founding this project. And it broke because some critters had got to it. This Ooh. was an amazing, <laughs> amazing necklace by a woman from the Nunganjara, Pitanjara, Yunkanajara lands that I bought from a women's organisation called the NPY Women's Council. It had no artist on its label, which was not is not uncommon. Um, and because these jewellers live in such remote places, traditionally their work was strung on human hair, which is very strong, but that's not appropriate for the marketplace. So people just use whatever they can get, which is usually elastic wool, fishing line, something completely inappropriate for a long, a, you know, long lasting, um, durable necklace. So um, the first thing that I really wanted to do was to get these jewellers proper materials for stringing. Um, they have an incredible sense of design and it's been noted a lot by a lot of non-Indigenous contemporary jewellers in Australia who really admire their work. Um, so we set about, I've got my stack of, this is my collection of the Indigenous Jewellery Project here, which will one day be an exhibition. Um, I buy pieces from jewellers as I go in order to one day curate a major exhibition, hopefully a book. Um, so we worked on getting their work onto proper materials. This is um, tiger tail, which is a very strong wire material. So this is where I work with Melinda Young in. So this this work was um, by an artist called Lynette Lewis from Ernabella in the, in the APY lands, and she was the first. Indigenous jeweller to be accepted into the National Contemporary Jewellery Awards. She got a solo exhibition at a public gallery in Canberra. So, you know, you can see the sense of skill and design and what can happen when there's just that support from the industry. Um, but the, the international uh, aspects that we've done, in 2020, uh, we had a very talented jeweller that we work with in the Torres Strait Islands who's actually doing her PhD on traditional Torres Strait Islander pearl shell jewellery, Emily Beckley. Um, she was in an exhibition in Parc au Bijou in Paris, which is a very big contemporary jewellery triennial. She was the first Australian Indigenous contemporary jeweller to exhibit in Paris. Um, this is one of her works up here. She wasn't able to come down to the university and work in the studio with M Mel Young. So she used what was around her. This is a piece of um, a fishing net and a plastic lid from her son's fishing boat. <laughs> but she was talking a lot about climate change in this exhibition. Um, this is another piece which is a piece of coral with a fishing net which is used to talk about the history of um, the pearl fishing industry in the Torres Strait Islands which was actually run under slave conditions. The Queensland government actually had Torres Strait Islanders doing very dangerous pearl 
fishing um, and they were getting no payment for it. It's a fascinating story. And they would write messages to each other on the coral so the authorities couldn't see it as a way of resistance and organising. But it also is about climate change because her reefs are being damaged, the coral reefs, and her islands are disappearing. Um, so Emily uh, also is reviving a tradition of bridal pendants. These are a tradition that men would make on the islands um, out of turtle shell. She's doing these in metal, and you can see the amazing metal work that she did. This was in the studio at Australian National University that we who were kind enough to give us their studio to work in and we did goldsmithing and silversmithing um, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists. Um, a lot of the skills with that come from a tradition of wood carving which exists across Indigenous Australia and I've really observed this incredible skill. Children are taught that skill from a very early age. So when it comes to carving in wax, which is how we make a lot of metal jewellery using the lost wax technique, people find it very easy. <laughs> um, so Emily's uh, work, this is her grandfather's design. He was a pearl shell carver. Um, and one of these uh, bridal pendants has actually been acquired by the National Gallery of Australia. I don't actually have it to show you. I'm looking for it, but it's in the National Gallery of Australia. Um, so she's been a very important uh, person, I think, internationally for really raising the, the level of um, Indigenous jewellery in, in the world. The second pro, uh, project, which was actually included two projects, was at the Shalani Women's Craft Collective at Craft Space at the University of uh, Birmingham. Birmingham City University, which has a very strong jewellery department. And they did an exhibition last year of uh, a whole lot of women's um, NGOs from Africa and Asia and Australia and the UK. Um, so we were included in that, which was very exciting. And they featured two projects, one that we did in northeast Arnhem Land. Um, we did a big project with Yolngu artists in Northeast Arnhem Land at a very prestigious art centre there called Buku Large Malka. Um, the women there make incredible traditional seed bead necklaces. This is the traditional ones nowadays strung on fishing line, which we worked with to, to find a more suitable stringing material. They also do incredible fish and shark vertebrae and parrot fish necklaces, which are incredible. Um, so we worked with those jewellers on three workshops. We ended up with 40 jewellers. <laughs> we, we were supposed to have 13 and the word got out and women were coming in from the bush saying, I'm here, I'm a jeweller, I'm not a bark painter, I'm not a weaver. There's a very strong sense of identity and people have roles traditionally where they are painters or weavers or jewellers. So all the jewellers came in um, and we did three workshops um, and one of the most successful pieces in the, the sort of marketplace of, of the gallery was these bark painting necklaces which are uh, the first time the tradition of bark painting was ever done for the body um these are by marnula munangor and uh they're you know her traditional um clan design and that was incredibly successful um Luckily, I don't think anybody could replicate that because it took about five lots of us sanding that stringy bark because it happens to be quite splintery and uh, to wear it without getting splinters. Um, even me as the jewellery assistant got RSI from all the sanding. So <laughs> I think it's a bit of a, a challenge for people to try to, to, you know, copy that and it's too much work. But um I think nowadays there's a lot more awareness around Indigenous design and the good thing about creating this project is that 
um, we've done so much education. I think um, people are really aware now more about Aboriginal design. Um, I can show you some more pieces from that show. This is a, a, a women's, which way am I going that way? A women's boomerang fighting club, gully gully. And the interesting thing about this is when this young woman who made this, Marawai Mala Yunapingu, her name is, she didn't really know, it, like she didn't really intend to consciously make this. And we looked it up at the Yolngu Dictionary and saw Gully Gully, Women's Fighting Club. So this project is sort of reviving language that is disappearing. When you were talking before about the materiality of the beads, you know, um, when I was in Central Australia working with um, women there, they still refer to the seed beads in language. So they'll still say dadu for seed and mangara for kwandong seed. When I went to Yirikala, they would say coffee bean or baked bean. So we went back to the Yongnu Dictionary and we found the proper Yongnu names for these and re introduce those Yongu names, you know, because jewellery has, a, it's it's a part of the language, isn't it? Um, yes, and the other, ex, the other um, project that was in um, the exhibition in the UK was a project that I did in 2021. Um, with the pandemic, it was very challenging for me to get out to communities and, you know, I didn't want to do that anyway because it wasn't safe. Um, so in 2021, we had no COVID cases in Victoria. So I was able to do a project in New South Wales, which hadn't even had it yet, um, in a place called Baranga, which is Gumbangia country, Barrowville. And this is some of the incredible work that was made there. This is an earring using the natural um tree it's a, a native australian tree and again the artists have you know incredible carving skills they were very good at working in metals just naturally um they were really able to pick up silversmithing so this is a traditional bower um a bird from bowerville this is a totemic bird this has got very deep significance for the women there. Um, and then this is another design where you can see the amazing skills that the silversmithing is really incredible for, you know, the first time that they've ever done a workshop. Um, so they were exhibited in the UK as well and they also made some earrings um, these also went to Darwin for a fashion parade, Aboriginal fashion parade. Um, and they also worked with traditional materials like emu feathers. This is an emu feather, an emu design. Emus are very sacred in Aboriginal societies. Um, and using the actual emu feathers. Well. So, yes. I think that is that about 10 minutes I've <laughs> gone over. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am, for such interesting uh, display of so many beautiful ethnic indigenous uh, necklaces and artworks. Thank you so much, <clears throat> ma'am. Uh, now I would like to uh, move on to the question and answer session. Now, Lin uh, Dr. Uh, Lindem, I also have one question for you. Uh, so hopefully that won't be a problem. Yes, sure, sure. That's all right. Okay. So, okay. So the first question is for Dr. Vandana Bhandari. Now, as you have experienced uh, in coordinating national level craft projects like Ustad, languishing crafts, what role do consumer perceptions play in the success of jewelry with tribal influences? And how can awareness be raised about the cultural significance behind these designs? So I think as I mentioned earlier, um, this is integral to any any design that we do, which has a strong uh, cultural identity. And uh, this is what uh, people have to do their branding around. This is what they have to educate the consumers about that, you know, 
um, th that these are the kind of things that are important. These elements are important. These materials are important. And we must, um, the, the shape or the, you know, like uh, Emily was also talking about, you have to you have to connect the consumer back to the cultural identity and branding has to has to in, engage with um uh, you know telling about the story of these people and educating consumers about the story of these people extremely important yeah thank you so much ma'am uh, the next question is for dr uh, lindem uh, Ma'am, since you have uh, done your PhD in design, uh, the doctoral thesis titled Cultural Appropriation and Semiotic Study of Textile Handwoven in Nagaland, the Angam and Sangam uh, tribe. Now, based on this, related to this, I would like to uh, ask you this question that how do members of Angami and Sangam tribes view the appropriation of their textile designs by the external entities? Since as it is now getting into the global market, how they are taking it and how the ingenuity is also preserved rather than getting affected or altered by the global market. Uh, I think uh, previous to what they, uh, the whole case was about, um, the tribes have become a bit more lenient towards contemporization. And they do have this understanding of ethical collaboration now uh, with uh, designers or whoever is working with the tribes and uh, but when they're doing this we must keep in mind the uh, considerate collaboration and co-designing as well as the marketing part of it and something that is very important in the Naga culture when you're creating uh, contemporary uh, pieces textiles or ornaments is that we should keep the appropriate ornament types uh, in mind because sometimes uh, a shawl that is used by that that was used by a naga warrior at the time even till now cannot be worn by a female uh, uh, or a girl you know because of that significant uh, symbolism and so even with ornaments it's the same thing a lot of uh, proper documentation and study has to be done uh, as well as the local names and everything has to be kept in mind just uh, as Emily has talked about it earlier. And even after doing a study of uh, the textiles or the ornaments, you should also understand the weight of the symbolism. Um, and another important thing that the tribes are doing right now, uh, if, if it's not the design that they're uh, working on, uh, if it's not that that they are mainly looking at, they're looking at retaining the sus uh, sustainability of the textiles and the ornaments. So mainly the introduction of new materials, but uh, materials that are sustainable. Um, yes, so that is about it. I think. Thank you so much, ma'am, for such a great answer. Uh, very educational. Uh, now I would like to ask the next question to Emily McCulloch Childs. Now, ma'am, under your la latest published book titled McCulloch's Encyclopedia of Australian Art and McCulloch's Contemporary Art, The Complete Guide, is there any interesting piece of tribal jewelry, design, motifs, or symbol used by the Aboriginals that is today respectfully adopted by the global market? Very little. <laughs> um, Really, actually, you know, Australian jewellery, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander jewellery really epitomises what the great anthropologist W.E.H. Stanner called the Great Australian Silence, where the colony of Australia has erased its origins and continued um, inhabitants as an Aboriginal place. I think we had... You know, one photo, this book is Contemporary Aboriginal Art. This came out in 2007. Um, it's the third edition. You know, we had one of these images here for the APY, NPY lands. Um, there's very little jewellery in here. Since then, um, things have changed dramatically, I think. I think now we're seeing 
a lot more. You know, my project led to other projects, which has been great. Um, and I think there's getting more and more awareness now of uh, the incredible um, and significant practice of Aboriginal and also the ways in which it can really epitomise what <clears throat> of contemporary jewellery is, which is connection to place and identity. Um, so hopefully we'll be seeing a lot more of it. We, I am just starting finally to work on the new edition, the fourth edition of that book um, this year. So there'll be a lot more in the next edition, let me tell you. <laughs> um, really and I, I'm ashamed to say contemporary um sorry encyclopedia of australian art this is a mammoth book that my grandfather started this book my mother and i continued to work on it it's 1.2 million words there's really actually i think only one contemporary jeweler in the whole book who's not in, even indigenous which is really shameful and in fact i was picked up you know, on that by contemporary jewellers and contemporary jewellery curators in Melbourne who made me, you know, do something about it, um, which also influenced me to create this project as well and got me really fascinated in contemporary jewellery. And, you know, now I make jewellery, I'm completely immersed in it. You know, it's become a huge passion of mine. Um, so, yes, I think, you know, the worlds of, um, of fine art, you know, the old European fine art, painting and sculpture and craft have been very separated in a Western country like Australia for so long and they're finally, you know, ceramics has become huge now, glass is becoming bigger, textiles are becoming bigger, weaving is becoming bigger. These are now finally sort of entering the mainstream lexicon of contemporary art in Australia and so slowly is contemporary jewellery. So with that, you know, hopefully more. Indigenous contemporary jewelry too. Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for the great answer and showing all the books because it was so interesting. And I'm uh, sure that even the audience would really appreciate and love it. Uh, the next question, I think we can uh, ask uh, like quickly the second set of questions. Um, it is for uh, both of you, ma'am, Dr. Lindem and uh, Vandana Bhandari, since you both are both have collaborated from the very beginning, you may both like kind of come and uh, talk about this answer. Uh, yeah, about this question. Did the adaptation of the tribal designs in the mainstream mainstream society affect the authenticity of the actual tribal jewelry? What ethical concern arise when mainstream brands use tribal designs, and how can these be addressed to ensure respectful cultural representation? So <clears throat> I think I'll just go quickly. Uh, of course, when they are adapted, the authenticity of the original design is affected. In any case, because of the loss of the original materials, uh, you know, as uh, was mentioned in the in the in the presentation, uh, we've moved from the original semi-precious stones or precious stones to uh, plastic or to wood or to other other materials that are used. So people have tried to maintain the design language often the materials have changed and in many ways that itself is a big change because uh, stones have such a strong uh, symbolic significance the way they are used so that has of course happened and uh, yes I think I will request Nisafi to answer how we can ensure respectful cultural representation <clears throat> you're on mute oh, ma'am you are muted So as we've talked about earlier in the presentation, there are a set of uh, uh, ethical uh, steps towards contemporization of textiles and Naga jewelry as well, which we had identified during uh, our study in the past. And uh, many of those we have mentioned already, such as uh, making sure that uh, we do ethical collaboration and co-designing as well as marketing of the products, uh, the appropriate ornament types. And a very important thing that we should keep in mind when we're contemporizing, especially with the Naga tribes, 
is that they always have their local village associations and it is very important to go through them before you uh, start any project so that's one big thing to keep in mind and we also need to remember that uh, as long as handloom and handicrafts survive as well as the cultural symbolism and ideas behind them uh, the the tribes themselves would also survive because the dress and the ornaments are the primary identifiers among especially the nagas themselves and as well as to the outsiders uh so yes a proper uh, in depth study and representation uh, of the naga uh, ornaments or textiles or craft is very important yeah and uh, i would also like to add one point like please uh, do correct me if i'm uh, wrong or if there's anything more to say there's mm -hmm. another thing that would be amazing is when the like buyers like us are also aware like okay the the new designs will have some kind of you know like uh, just like um, linda ma'am mentioned that the ivory or the animal teeth is now replaced with plastic but like consumers like us should be aware that it was originally used and now for the contemporary use for the mainstream users like us we are using plastics so these awareness being educated is very much important especially when using them because that is how the things will get preserved in this rapid going generation so thank you so much yes that's absolutely true uh, yeah that's correct uh, the next uh, question is for uh, the last but not the least question is for Emily McCulloch Childs. As the leading creator of the Indigenous Jewelry Project, can you provide information on the cultural significance of Indigenous Jewelry highlighted by IJP? What initiatives does uh, this project undertake to raise awareness about the importance of Indigenous Jewelry and its cultural context to the mainstream media? When I started doing this project, we were working with a community in the Western Desert of Australia. And one of the artists said to me, you know, jewellery is not new. Jewellery has always been here. And it's more important than painting. Jewellery is the trunk of the tree of our culture and painting is a branch. And I think this is the opposite of what all of us in Australia would actually know about Aboriginal art because paint, Ab Aboriginal artists have been so incredible. And they are, you know, very, very renowned um, with painting. It's such a fundamental practice. Um, I think that by engaging with galleries who are particularly in the contemporary craft world, so, you know, working with the Australian Design Centre in New South Wales, with Craft ACT in ACT, with Artisan in Queensland, with these kinds of really major public galleries, for them to exhibit this work, the amount of education that we do um, and the way that the work is displayed in a very sophisticated way, it's really making the audience aware that this is incredible work and it really opens people's eyes. You know, a lot of people in Australia don't even know that Aboriginal people make jewellery. Um, so by doing things like we did an exhibition for Sydney Craft Week and they had an artist market on, at the Australian Design Centre and they had thousands of people coming into the gallery where we had, you know, hundreds of pieces, a catalogue essay, biographies of the artists, information on all of the works, um, photographs that Mel Young and I had taken in the workshops of the country and the people and the artists. And these were sometimes people who came into that space were people who wouldn't even go into a gallery. And they got so excited and they were buying pieces and they were, you know, really becoming very excited about the whole world that they've never seen before. 
So I think jewelry can be very engaging, like you would more something that people wear, <clears throat> you know, um, rather than you don't have to go to someone's house to see, you know, a painting. Like you can't wear it's hard to wear a painting. I mean, fashion you can wear paintings, but um jewelry is such an accessible way. So this is really what the Indigenous Jewelry Project is trying to do is working, you know, breaking down the barriers between these worlds, um, as well as, you know, helping these jewelers maintain and give them support for their practice and help them to develop to develop new skills. Um, and I think, you know, it would be good to do more international projects. Um, but for the moment, we're just going to keep working around Australia as much as we can. And um, yeah, working with different communities, because every community has jewelers. <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am. It is a great cause. And um, it is absolutely like a privilege to have you all here. And, you know, it's very inspiration as well to hear every one of you. Uh, so, yeah, this brings us to the end of today's session. <laughs> I thank all the panelists once again for sharing their invaluable perspectives on this topic. This is to remind that we are calling for submission on tribal art and tribal representation in art, the details of which can be viewed on www.tellmeyourstory.biz. We will come back to you soon with our next panel discussion on the project. Till then, good night, Emily, ma'am, and have a good day, everyone. Thank you. A good day to everybody. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you.